Hi, welcome to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. We have a great guest in the studio tonight. My friend Terry Katzman has been involved in various levels of the Twin Cities music scene since the late 1970s. Tonight we're here to talk about a great new project that just came out called Husker Du, Savage Young Du. Recordings, uh, live recordings, unreleased recordings by one of the greatest bands in America, Husker Du, from about 1979 to 1982. Uh, many of the tunes which were recorded by my guest, Terry Katzman. We have a lot to talk about, so we're going to just jump right into it. Now, you were, uh, you know, working closely with the band. You had really three disparate personalities, all strong personalities uh, that always didn't get along. Did you ever have to bring a little salve and ointment to those relationships? You know, you, usually though, I, 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 that was or above. Or did you run like hell and stay Yeah, away yeah from I that? mean, that was above my head. I could tell sometimes if they weren't occasionally not getting along, but not in those days because it was. It was a it was a combined spirit. Everybody right. was fight, you know working for the same goal, but uh, uh, all for one and one for all, right? In in some of the older shows, I would just if it was a particularly intense show, I wouldn't even go near them for a while after they are done. You know, they'd just all be sitting downstairs fuming, or you know just exhausted. So I'd just leave them alone for a while. Right. Come That's back. how seriously they took it. Oh yeah, very seriously. I mean, it was a mission, you know. And after Land Speed, after they did the tour, the Land Speed that resulted in the Land Speed tour, then it was even moved to another level, you know, a level that even I hadn't seen before because I hadn't seen them for three months when they left, and then they came back, and I'm like, oh my God. What happened to them, you know, that's what happens right. when you hang around with L.A. punk bands. You become really fast. and Right. But, I mean, it's not something that's sustainable forever. Right. It's not a sustainable thing. It's a, it's a moment in time kind mm -hmm. of a thing. So. What, uh, did, you, did you do much sound for them on the road? Hardly at all. I mean, usually I did, I did one road trip with them, which is, you know, just about, you know, killed me. Tell I us went the story. to well we went the the I went uh to Chicago, Madison and Milwaukee was it Chicago, Madison and Milwaukee? Yeah. One time in, in in eighty where they played this club called the Oz in Chicago, which is where I met and it was significant. This was March March of eighty because this was the first time that the, the Black Flag people had saw them, you know, and so we went to a party across town after they played. This is also where we first got, you know, in touch with a lot of the Chicago bands that would help them out, you mm -hmm. know, the Effigies, Naked Ray Gun, Da, all those bands and that warmed them up. Uh, so that, that was a trip, you know, that was a trip that was... I knew that I wasn't really meant for the road. You know, I had the store and stuff. Right. There's just no way. And so my last really official show that I really worked for them was was a party, I think, in 84, where I did sound. And pretty shortly after that, Lou, you know, they were starting to tour, so they needed someone to go with them, mm -hmm. you know. So that's when Lou, they hired Lou Giordano, and so Lou finished up the rest of their career. He was their sound man until the end. Well. Right. So they have they have one other sound sound guy too I think maybe for a while but Lou pretty much brought it home in the end so I saw boy I want to say just about every show Husker, Husker the Huskers did at uh, on the main stage at First Avenue and there was always that you were either in the replacements camp or you're in the Husker Du camp and I loved them both but truthfully from what I saw from a musician perspective you could always count on Mold and Company to, you know, always be at the top of their game. The replacements was a little more dicey. But with, with this, you know, at least in the public, there was always this, these two camps. How do you think, you think it was really there between the bands? Did they have competition? Well, I think it was friendly competition, but most people don't realize, you know, they played shows together. Right. They, they, you know, they, they played two or three, four entry shows together where they'd, one time they'd switch off. They did it 
one thing once where they played four sets. They each played like Huskers played, replacements played, Huskers played, replacements played. There was one, right. of, those, one of those type of things. So, yeah, I mean, obviously there was there was some competition. I I think, you know, with the with the kind of the the twin tone ep- episode with the repla- you know the twin tone story with replacements and and Husker's story with Reflex, which is now well known because the first single was basically a, a you know a, sort of giving the middle finger to Twin Tone. Right. You know so that's what Reflex meant. Reflex was a reflex against Twin Tone not putting out the Statues single, but it all worked out for the best. They weren't a twin tone type band, right? You know, there was no really, there was no one really there that would that would support them. I was the one that supported them, but I didn't really work for Twin Tone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I didn't discover Who's Do. I just went along for the ride. <laughs> so, and it was a hell of a ride. Yeah, oh, yeah, still, and it's still going in yeah. some ways. So, we've got uh, Terry Katzman on for the whole show on Wall of Power TV tonight. I'm your host, Paul Metzen. We'll be back after these messages. I want you to meet two gingers Irish whiskey. I'm Kieran and I'm Irish, so I tend to like a challenge. Why not? I wanted a whiskey to help find me out what's out there. Like what's really out there. And I found the oldest distillery in Ireland with a water wheel and awards for its small family of whiskies in the middle of Ireland. As I've always seen it, you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So try it. The investment is small and the flavor is big. It's perfect for drinking neat. Its character holds up, like the Irish, when the bastards try to get you down. Two gingers Irish whiskey. Distilled twice for more character, time for more flavor, and less of the old burn. No litte bastard is carborundum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Welcome back to Wall of Power TV. I'm your host, Paul Metza. My guest and my good friend, Terry Katzman. We've been talking uh, about Husker Du, the rise of Husker Du. And uh, we got up to Reflex Records. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about how long that label, uh, the, the, the band's label, existed before SST uh, and Greg Ginn? Well, the, the Reflex label per se lasted from, the, from 80 to 85. So it was originally set up to record, so they would have a label to record on and put a single out so they could take something to sell with them. That right. was the, the most basic. After, after we did that, we, we decided we wanted to showcase some local bands, too, as releases. That's what led to our Barefoot and Pregnant and Kitten compilations, which were like punk rock compilations. Mm-hmm. One was recorded live at Goofy's Upper Deck, and the other one was sort of amalgamation of demos that we received from a lot of the bands that played with Husker then. Right. You know, Rifle Sport, Man Sized Action, <coughs> you know, Idle Threat. So a lot of the Upper Deck contingent so that that's how and then it sort of started growing more and more because uh, uh, I started working with Man Sized Action Bob had produced their first record and I produced the second one and went on to work with Rifle Sport and Bob had his interest with a band called Articles of Faith a Chicago band so and we worked with another band called Ground Zero put out two records with with under their name and it, the last actual release was a Minutemen single in 85 called the Tour, Tour Spiel EP, which was sort of a favor to Mike Watt uh, putting out the, it was an exchange that we were going to put out a, a Minutemen single if they put, out, they put out the Inner Freeland thing. So it was kind of an exchange, an agreement. Right. Uh, that that we almost got sued for too, but that's another story. Um, so that was sort of the end. once they started touring more and more. Reflex started, yeah, you know, because they just weren't busy enough to pay attention to it. So 
uh, we finally did get some distribution with a with a company called Dutch East India sure. that distributed our stuff for a while, and so they they took on like the last four projects that we did, and then finally it it quietly closed up. And after we did the Minutemen single in '85 was the last Reflex release. Okay, about so the, the, about the time that they were working on New Day Rising, right? That was the end of Reflex, basically. So then, uh, tell us about the evolution of SST, then Warner Brothers. Well, once, 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 once they did Zen Arcade, and that came out, and it had, you know had glowing reviews from what Chris Go and everybody, right. you know, then then the major labels started sniffing around them. They right. are, they'd had some interest already, but they were too busy recording, so they went in. They did New Day Rising almost immediately after Zen, and that garnered them even more. That had celebrated summer on it, you know, one of Bob's really great songs and books about UFOs. So that was that was starting the drum drum beat again, and then they, as they were going to record, flip your wig. They had already had a really already had an offer from Warner's, but they 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 wanted to give SST the last record. So that's why Flip Your Wig, Flip Your Wig was originally slated to go to Warner's, but through their loyalty, which I don't know about that, um, <laughs> but uh, through their their loyalty, they wanted to give it to SST. That la so as soon as, I think it's pretty soon after they delivered that, that's when they signed, they signed with Warner's. So, but you know, the Warner's period is sort of a smaller period than their other period, because there's only two records involved there. Right. Well, three, if you count the live Now, album. Terry, what was it like? I mean, you were there, you were, you must have been one of the first guys when either, you know, I don't know if, if Mold did acoustic demos and brought them the band or Grant did acoustic demos, but the first time, you were probably one of the first guys to hear some of those great tunes. Well, yeah, sometimes, I didn't really, you know, I think people people think I got a lot of a lot of uh, total access, no pun, right. to the studio. I really didn't. I was I was and all the time that they actually recorded, I was invited over one time, hmm. one time when they were working on on New Day and Spot was in town, and it was not a very a very comfortable evening for me. You know, they weren't they were starting to butt heads with Spot, right? You know, and it, I don't think it, it made as much sense. For Spot to come to Minneapolis as it did when they went out to record with him in L.A., so I think that was the very kind of the end of the. That's why Flip Your Wig was self-produced, you know, mm -hmm. they did, you know, produced with Bob and Grant and Steve Felstead. We've got Terry Katzman on the Wall of Power TV. There's always something going on at Grumpy's. For happy hour on Monday, it's half price beer and wine. Killer prices on local taps all day, Saturday, and bottles of wine at half price every Sunday. At night, the turntables at Grumpy's stay busy with the Minnesota Music Listening Party on Monday and Vino Vinyl on Thursday night. Trailer Park Trivia packs the house on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And don't miss T-Bone Bingo on Sunday nights. They have it all. Every night of the week, it's Grumpy's Northeast. Tell us now... Uh, this set, Who's Could Do Savage Young Do, uh, 69 songs in a book, great photos. Um, for any, anybody that's got Who's Could Do Loving Friends and Family, perfect Christmas gift. But tell us a little bit more about the other songs that are on here in their, in their sources. Well, it's, 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 uh, it has uh, Inner uh, in Free Land and Statues, which are their two single efforts, which which uh, came out. One came out on New Alliance. One came out on Reflex. Those are in there. Plus, their their first studio record, Everything Falls Apart, and then a different, a kind of a reconfigured Land Speed record. Not the same Land Speed record that you're used to hearing. It was from from an earlier gig that they played about a month prior, and the sound quality is way 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 better. So. Numero, I think, decided to go that route rather than having any kind of issues with, with their former label because all this stuff is non-SST controlled. Any of the stuff that they did under SST's auspices is owned by SST. Right. However, any of the stuff that I recorded with them, and with their consent, was ours to do what with what we right. wish with. So, so how many how many uh, tracks do you have your imprint on here, Terry? Of how 
uh, how many are mine? I think yeah. I think about about I, I don't know exactly number wise about seventy percent of it is mine. Wow, sixty or seventy percent of it is my stuff. So well, you got to be pretty proud that it's finally seeing the light of day. I mean, you you've told me about this for years. Yeah, the kind of stuff you have. I've I been know. over to your house. Yeah, I've seen the uh, parts of your archives that that, that are, are you know suitable for for friends and family to see. I'm sure you have another stash somewhere you're not sharing with anybody, but. Um, uh, so it feels good to finally get this out, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a great feeling for me. It's bittersweet somewhat with Grant being yeah. gone. But I mean, Grant was aware of what was happening. He, he saw all the art. He knew what the tracks were going to be. He didn't, right. didn't live long enough to see the physical product. He missed it by a few weeks. But wow. again, you know, that makes it bittersweet but it also makes it more special as well yeah. that, that it is out now because we've been laboring over this thing for way way too long right. really should have you know to be honest it should have come out like six years ago five or six years ago it's just it, it things got complicated and you know whenever there's legal issues you have to you know you have to wade through those and I had to even get I had to have representation right because uh, you know the band was being represented by somebody but I needed to be represented by someone too that knew kn knew how to handle these things because I was in way over my head. Yeah, you know, so I that's why I I needed help and and Pete Jesperson referred me to a, a pretty sharp guy in California, uh, David Lessoff. So that's who I've been using. So I've just uh, the later negotiations. I just if someone has a question, I just say call David and then let me know what you're going to do. Right. You know, I tried to stay out of it as much as possible. I didn't want to have any missteps or take any chances that it was going to be another three years before it came out. Right. So I just kept my mouth shut. Right. You know. Well, hard for you to do. Yeah, especially <laughs> for me. And especially when it comes to them. Too, yeah, sure. You know, so I really had to just, and then, you know, you know, I've talked to you about it and other people, yeah, it's coming out, it's coming yeah. out. Well, when? I mean, this didn't really become official till almost a year ago right now. I mean, that's when Bob finally inked his side of the agreement. So once November of last year rolled around, then things started to really move into high gear, and that's when I submitted all my, you know, they have 75 shows, and they have all my Husker tapes, wow. I, which have never really left my house in all these years. So I'm like, I want to make arrangements to get those back <laughs> at some point but i mean that 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 was the agreement they wanted to see a full scope of what i had and so they they had the final choice and what was being chosen i i couldn't choose what even if it was my stuff they chose i directed them in a few down a few roads that right. i think so they didn't forget a couple things that i insisted that they really had to use but you know it was basically their their choice of what they wanted to use who did the liner notes uh, her name is uh, 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 Erica Osman, I believe is her name. She did a really great job. I mean, for someone who wasn't here, who really had no prior knowledge, or maybe she did of the band, she did an amazing job. And I wrote some notes, too, that they sort of chopped up and right. spread throughout the throughout the the package, you know, just technical notes basically and reference notes up to what shows were connected to this performance and where it, it lodged in the timeline. Right. So, Well, Terry Castle, we could, you know, have a whole other show about your post Huskadoo life at Garage Door Records, your own label, and things like that. We'll, we'll, and, and we'll do that in another show. A, a couple, couple more things I want to ask you. You look back and we're about the same age. We pretty much came of age in the same time. You and your style of music, uh, me and my style of music, there was a lot of crossover of people like us that love all kinds of music. Oh, sure. Um, and you look back just, you know, on the, our last show, we had, you know, Chris Ryman started with his great First Avenue book. We've got Andrea Swenson coming on with her history of uh, uh, funk and soul in the Twin Cities, Jim Walsh's book uh, with Prince. John Bream's book. There's just such a um, plethora of information in that time, especially the 80s in uh, Minneapolis, mm -hmm. which was really ground zero in really the early to mid to late part of the 80s with, with Who's Could Do, The Replacements, and, uh, and Prince, of course. 
did you feel it at the time, or did it just kind of seem like, were, were we taking it for granted at how good the scene was? Of course. You, ever, doesn't everyone? Yeah. I mean, no, it, you, you really, I mean, you don't really think about it until it's not there anymore. Right. And then you realize, geez, I went through all this. I mean, I think about it sometimes. I, boy, I went through all this stuff, and I just... I, I think some people think it was maybe a skill. I was just, it was just in the right place at the right time back mm -hmm. then. I mean, I mean, if you were going to get hired at Orfolk in 1976, I mean, you couldn't get, f right. figure a better time. Right, you right. Know, you two months before the Sex Pistols single came out or whatever. I mean, it was, you know, so, but yeah. I, Preordained I, in a yeah, way, kind of, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think about it, but you don't, you don't, I think most people that go through something like that, you only get to have that once. Right. You only get to, it's not something, it's not something that you can ever go back to, or you can only revisit it here. Right. But you can't Or really, here. Or there, yeah. So, I mean, which again makes for the importance of this coming out now, because it, it really wraps up that whole period pretty, pretty, Pretty succinctly, I think, so. I want to ask you one more thing. I wasn't close friends with him, but, but, I, but I spent enough time to get a feel for the man and the artist who we just lost uh, in this last year. But give us some um, parting thoughts about Grant Hart, the drummer and great songwriter uh, from Who's Could Do. Uh, I guess he just, he's just was one of the warmest, nicest people that that I ever knew and the most fun to be with. Plus, plus just his whole outlook uh, on music and art was, was unique. I mean, he was sort of a free spirit in that, you know, he, he wanted to do so many different things. He was always moving. His mind was always moving, whether it was painting or, or graphic design or playing drums or playing piano or working on his own solo stuff. I mean, it was, you know, a modern man, you know, yeah. that's what he was. Modern artist. Yeah, modern, you know, good news for modern man, like his record said, so, <laughs> you know, and he, so. Yeah, well, that's a beautiful way to remember him. Terry Katzman, I, I want to tell you, it's an honor to uh, be your friend for years. You've given me a lot of advice uh, over the years. You've listened to my stuff when I've gone in to talk about mixes, records, whatever, You've always been a big supporter of mine, and, and I want to thank you personally for that. Well, thank you, Paul. It's been great. It's always great knowing you. We always have great time together, and I think we, we share a lot of similar views on we Minneapolis sure music. So, And if people want to get Who's Could Do, Savage Young Do, and have you sign it personally, I would suggest they go down to one of my favorite record stores in town, Hi-Fi Heron Records. 1635, right yep, Hennepin, right down by the Basilica, and I'll, I'd be happy to sign anybody's copy. I'd be more than happy. I'm never too busy for that. So, so get down to Hi-Fi Heron Sound, get a copy of Huskadoo, Savage Young Do. There's a ton of other records down there, including my own. Say hi to Terry once again. What days is that, Terry? Do I'm down, down there Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And occasionally you might even see him tag teaming with Steve McClellan. You never know. You never know. That would be Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, thanks for watching Wall of Power TV. This is your host, Paul Metza. We're here every Saturday night, 8 p.m. And uh, replay at 11.30 p.m. So stick around next week. We'll have another great new show. We'll save you a seat. Thanks for watching. There's always something going on at Grumpy's. For happy hour on Monday, it's half price beer and wine. Killer prices on local taps all day, Saturday, and bottles of wine at half price every Sunday. At night, the turntables at Grumpy stay busy with the Minnesota Music Listening Party on Monday and Vino Vinyl on Thursday night. Trailer Park Trivia packs the house on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And don't miss T-Bone Bingo on Sunday nights. They have it all. Every night of the week, it's Grumpy's Northeast.
houses, tried to get on the family farm, shut down all the unions with the help of the National Guard. Someday those in Congress will have to swallow a bitter pill. They believe Clarence Thomas, but I still believe they need a heal. Not all poor men are honest, not all rich men are thieves. But the rich man owns the orchard and the poor man rakes the leaves. And as the world goes around, I said, all I want to ask is, Johnny, if the rich man owns the land, why must the poor man pay the taxes? Why does justice go so slow? Slow justice slowly goes. And he comes step with white means go. Slowly go. Why did justice go so slow? Slow justice slowly go. Call me stop and rich means go. Slow justice slowly go. Why did justice go so slow? Slow justice slowly go. Little girl means stop, little boy means go.